And we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the stream. I hope you're well, that you had a nice beginning of the week and all that. Uh, I'm very happy to have you back here for another interview with a member of the European Parliament. Tonight, we switch back to English, as you can hear, and we will discuss with MEP Petar Vitanov uh, from the Socialist and Democrat Group, so the, on the left side of EU politics. So he's 40 years old. It's his first mandate. He's an MEP since 2019. And He comes from Bulgaria. Uh, he's a member in the Parliament uh, of the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. He's also a member of the Committee on Transport and Tourism. And he's a substitute in the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and the Special Committee on COVID. So he is a busy man. Uh, within these committees, uh, he focuses mostly on, on the social aspects of the Green Deal, the social aspect of transport policy, and the fundamental right impacts of uh, artificial artificial intelligence. Uh, but before we start uh, the conversation with Mr. Vitanov, as usual, I remind the house rules for anyone who would be new with us tonight. So our guest will be with us for about an hour. After that, he, he will go and enjoy the rest of his evening uh, or, or work a, a bit more in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, and you will be stuck with me for 15 to half an hour to discuss, uh, to debrief the interview, discuss what you thought, cover questions that we're going to cover during the interview, that sort of things. Uh, as usual, I've prepared my questions, but you can, of course, propose, suggest questions in the chat. It's there for that. I will keep an eye on it. But do that, uh, as always, without spamming and while staying civil. Uh, and of the final important point, of course, we'll talk about European politics. So we won't cover national politics unless it's related to EU politics. So keep that in mind when suggesting your question in chat. And on this note, well, I suggest that we uh, jump right into it. Good evening, Petar Vitanov. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us tonight, especially during your plenary uh, week. It's uh, it's always very busy for for, for MEPs and, and your teams. Um, so you you heard me do my little introduction, introducing who you are, what you do, etc. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add before uh, about yourself before we uh, we jump into it? No, I have nothing to add. Am I online now? Yes, you're online. People can see you. Welcome. No, please. Then then I have to excuse. Um, myself or my bad English, especially at nine o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm sick of, you know, everybody says the MEPs are busy. Of course they are busy, but they, they should not complain because they choose that job. I mean, nobody pointed me a gun, I, you know, for it. So <laughs> hopefully <basically laughs> <laughs> to be here. So of course, uh, nobody should complain about the fact that uh, he's, he or she's busy. Of course, this is part of the job, but it makes it even more thrilling. Mm -hmm. So let, let's start with you, actually. Uh, how and why did you go into politics and then became an MEP? What was a, what was a spark for you? What, what uh, uh, pushed you to go into politics? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. I'm a third generation socialist. <laughs> so it's like, uh, that's why it didn't, it didn't come out of the blue. I guess it's like in my genes. I don't know. Uh, my, 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 my grandfather was a mayor in a relatively big Bulgarian city, but he passed away, unfortunately, some 25 years ago. But still, when I was a child, uh, everybody around me was speaking about politics, politics, uh, national, international, the local. So it's like part of my life from, from the very beginning. And I knew from the very beginning that I want to deal with that. Uh, to, because look... Social, I mean, being a socialist means that you are not only care for yourself, but also for the environment, also for, for the people around you, for the community, for the city, for the, for the country. So, so this is so natural for me. So that's why uh, from the very beginning, I wanted uh, to do politics. So this was so natural and obviously it happened. I mean, I didn't push for it. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And so now you're, you're, in, uh, you're in the European Parliament. Uh, you are, as it happens, the head of the Bulgarian SND delegation. So you're, you're the boss of the Bulgarian so socialists. So uh, we are simply five people. I'm not the boss. So yeah, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm simplifying. But uh, let's say that you represent the, the Bulgarian socialists within the, the, the bigger socialist group. So how does it, how, do, how does it work as as a head of delegation how do you handle the relationship with your with your, the rest of your group how do you what do you do as a head of delegation basically well you have a lot more responsibilities because 
you have different formats here. Uh, there are certain group meetings, formal and informal. And in this capacity, I have to participate in some of them are horizontal, some of them are only amongst the heads of the delegation or the bureau members, but I get it. I guess it gets too technical, but these are additional uh, responsibilities. But this is also very tempting because uh, you are, I don't know whether I should say this, but this is like a smaller circle of decision, make, uh, decision making process, which is, I would say, yeah, kind of kind of put additional flavor in it. So, um, yes, I partic participate in this capacity in many, many different formats. It's quite satisfying, I should say. Well, that's great. That's great. And so now in the in the different committees, one of your one of your how, how, sorry, one of the yeah, it's difficult maybe to communicate with everybody because here in the European Parliament, there are quite a lot of people with a lot, lot of experience, uh, with very I would say colorful, uh, with a lot of ego, but this is absolutely normal because we have a lot of former prime ministers, ministers of foreign affairs, all kinds of ministers from everywhere. So it's really difficult to communicate with all these people, even in your own delegation. There's relations on different levels. So you have to be communicator mm -hmm. if you want to be a good head of delegation. I don't know whether I'm good or not, but uh, yeah, you have to, to find a way to communicate with everybody, which is, it might seem easy, but imagine if you have to deal with a former prime minister and former minister of foreign affairs who hate the prime minister, then it gets kind of complicated. Yes, I, I can imagine but, that. Uh, I'm glad that we don't have this situation in the Bulgarian delegation. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's that's fortunate. But so now let's talk a, a bit about policy. Uh, one of your priority is the work on the Green Deal, so the, the big environmental policy of uh, of the EU. And the Green Deal has become a big priority for the EU since the beginning of the mandate. But since the beginning of the mandate, we have seen the pandemic, we have seen the war in Ukraine, which created an energy crisis, an economic crisis. And so there is tension between this crisis and the Green Deal. So do you think that the Green Deal and the ambition of the Green Deal should be reduced to uh, let's say uh, reduce the impact of, the, uh, of uh, uh, energy prices of the economy economic recovery, or should we stay as ambitious on the green deal no matter the crisis? Jeez, I don't think it's a matter of ambition here. Uh, look, I'm also a father. I have two children. They're almost grown ups, but still, uh, I know what they breathe. I know uh, the quality of the air in Bulgaria, which kills some several four or four or five thousand people uh, every year and I know that the climate change are in, almost inevitable now and they're extremely dangerous and we, we all see not only the environmental consequences of these uh, climate changes but also we see the uh, economic consequences soon we will see the social consequences and I'll give you a simple example you remember the Rain River? And I can tell you about the Danube River, which passes through Bulgaria. And it was the level, uh, the level of water was so low that uh, even boats were not allowed in the river, which means that this is extremely, this is extremely important economic vein of my country. But also let's take, for example, uh, rain here uh, in, in, in Germany. You know that this is very important for the economy. When you have that low level of, uh, of water, then you cannot transport goods or you transport on the barge a uh, smaller amount of goods, which makes the transport more expensive, which makes the cost of the, any uh, good more expensive. And take Loire, in, for instance, in France. Well, the level of the water was so low that uh, France had to turn off the nuclear power plants, uh, half of them, because they don't, they didn't have uh, enough water to cool off. So basically, we all see the negative consequences of the climate change. We see the climate migrants, we see the arable land uh, shrinking. So we had to do something, and this is this is a matter of solidarity, because you are. 
giving up some resources that you can use now so that your kids have future or to have at least the same conditions that you used to have when you were when you were a kid this is one hand this is the on one hand the environmental uh, reason behind the green deal but there is also another one and if you take the war i'm not talking about the COVID here because i think that the war is also very um let's say uh how to say it, it can be used as a proof mm-hmm. because the war showed us one thing i mean even borel said it uh, a week ago that the prosperity of europe is due to the security uh coming from the united states the the market coming from china and the, the almost the cheap energy resources coming from from russia so those three pillars are the base of the european uh, prosperity now obviously i'm not going to talk about the the the, the market in china or the the security in the states but let's speak about the energy resources obviously we cannot rely on the cheap energy resources no more so if you if we want to keep the prosperity of the european continent we should have the independent energy system and in order to do so you have to make a a, i would say green but energy transition and this energy transition is absolutely in line with the green deal what we we need more energy efficiency we need uh, more renewables we need hydrogen we need to use water for our energy so that we don't need to rely on neither russia or azerbaijan or american lng because who knows what is going to happen in america in five years Hmm. so that's why the green deal is something that we need uh to foster uh so i don't think that there are just the war is another proof that we should continue doing it yes uh the 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 big question is how we go for it because if you ask the the right the epp if you ask the european uh, people's party they would say the business is more important we can close our eyes for the uh, climate change but the business is important because the business feed people and if you ask the greens they will say we are dying as uh, the planet is dying the planet is suffering so we have to make this change no matter what on behalf of the back even of the uh, vulnerable groups and we socialists say that yes we take into consideration that we cannot do it the way we used to the economy should be completely different we should use circular economy this old model of producing something uh producing something consume and throw away is no longer possible but at the same time yes we need transition but this transition should come not at the expense of those who suffer of those who are vulnerable of the poor people because every fucking revolution comes on the back of the poor Mm-hmm. Let, let's speak uh, uh, about that for, for, for a second because well, that was actually my, my, my next question how do we you, you know that in the green deal social acceptability so the ability of well, people to accept how do you deal with that because you know for instance in france we had the yellow jacket that started with yeah. uh, with, with environmental uh, concerns well as an opposition to environmental uh, concerns so how do we make sure that the green deal uh, is ambitious enough to fight climate change but without breaking the back of let's say the more the, the poorer people the people that need that are in social needs because this should be this green deal should be made uh, with in a social in a socially responsible way in order to do so you need money yes this is going to be a long painful process and maybe everybody will lose but then in the end maybe we will benefit from all those uh, efforts that we have made through the road through the way so how exactly i can be abstract but i can be the concrete for instance uh, we have 15 pieces of legislation uh, so called fit for 55 which describe the idea of the green deal i mean these are uh, 
some uh, laws concerning the building the infrastructure for the electric vehicles uh, or some uh, transformation in the um, uh, maritime uh, transport or in the air transport or you have some uh, uh, some adjustments in the European um, um, emission trading system and so on and so forth but there are also some laws that uh, give this social flavor of this green deal and i mean for, for, and i mean for instance the so-called uh, social climate fund which is basically a fund supposed uh, money a huge amount of money which is supposed to benefit those who will suffer most from this uh, from this transition and it will help out in both ways directly through direct support or through different investments to those who are vulnerable so we are not going to create additional energy poverty or additional transport poverty um, for the for the people who now barely make it so these are and this is the initiative of the socialists so if we have enough money or if we redistribute the money to those who really need it we will make this transition socially responsible and uh, when talking about the green deal i had I had someone from uh, bulgarian asking uh, uh, being a bit worried uh, that uh, oil companies for instance had the opportunity to, to have meetings with the european commission so they were worried that the green deal would be undermined by uh, by oil companies by energy companies etc do you have the feel the feeling since you are in brussels you are uh, used to how our European politics works. Are you worried to see that there is too much lobbying from companies that would like to try to undermine the Green Deal? Or is it like manageable? It's not uh, It's not too bad as, uh, as it is. Well, lobbying is something legal in Brussels. So yes, and I, I will be honest, I meet a lot of people and a lot of... Uh, um, from that perspective, a lot of uh, experts who lobby for one or another uh, company or sector, but this is something absolutely normal. To me, to me, what is really important when we speak about the Green Deal, and this is the bottom line, that those who pollute, they must pay. And if you take the statistic, you will see that the biggest polluters are the biggest companies, or even people who can afford a lot of things, wealthy, rich people, they pollute way more than, uh, than the retired guy who barely su who, who suffers uh, for, for, um, and barely make it. So uh, I'm, to me, this is the core of the Green Deal. But of course, uh, from, it's hard to see from the bubble in Brussels everything, I must say. But the good thing is that I go home and I see even um, different perspectives. Yes, it is going to be painful. And I know that one of the biggest challenges in this green transition is how to keep the competitiveness of the European companies. Because we all know, no matter we are socialists or uh, uh, Christian Democrat or uh, conservative, we, we all know that we need uh, sustainable jobs. And if we jeopardize the competitiveness, then everybody will suffer. So uh, we also think not only of the poor people, but also of those who uh, feed those people, who give them the ability to work. Uh, and yes, the challenge is to make this transformation on a socially responsible way on one hand, by keeping the competitiveness of the European economy. And uh, another question that I had from someone from, from, from Bulgaria in, in the link between Green Deal and the energy crisis. So uh, the, the person was asking, what do you think about the, the, the Germans who, for instance, are, uh, let's say, having a back and forth about whether to keep uh, nuclear plants or whether they should close them and have a, a, an open coal plants in instead. So what do you think about that? Do you think, in the end, do you think that we should keep nuclear to in the context of the energy crisis or should we get rid of them because nuclear is polluting, etc. Now, uh, first, maybe to to uh, mention something about the so-called link between the energy crisis and the Green Deal. Uh, 
I think that this is uh, exaggerated. Yes, to some extent, uh, the prices of energy sources might be a little bit higher because of the Green Deal. But let's be honest, the, uh, the price hikes are not due to the Green Deal. Let's, let's see how it started. Uh, first, there was a demand for, for more energy because of the uh, re recovery after the COVID, which led to a lot, uh, especially starting in Asia. So a lot of energy sources were distributed to Asia, to the Asian market, because uh, uh, they were, the Asians were ready to pay more. So uh, we missed the opportunity to fill our uh, gas tanks here in Europe last year. Then uh, the demand became more e e on, in the European continent and there was not enough energy here. So the price went up. Then, of course, the war in Ukraine, when everything changed, obviously we couldn't use the, the cheap energy sources from Russia or at least we have some difficulties, less quantities, higher price. And yes, the share of the Green Deal to add up to this cocktail is maybe the emission trading system. But compared to the price, it's nothing. So uh, this energy crisis is not due to the Green Deal. But the Green Deal might be the solution of this, this energy crisis. Now, when we speak about the, the nuclear uh, it's simple for us. Uh, we Bulgarian socialists believe that uh, that uh, we should that one one of the biggest achievements of the 20th century is uh, creating the atom. So uh, we believe that uh, nuclear energy could be also one of the solutions to the energy crisis, and we have always advocated for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for the nuclear, uh, from the yeah, nuclear power plants and in Bulgaria, we have very sustainable and long-lasting position on that. And you can see even the, the I would say the, the European Parliament very progressive. Even in my own group, my own political family, very progressive, very in favor of renewables, not for, in favor of nuclear. But now even they switch position because in this situation in this crisis this is an opportunity for cheap energy and if we tackle the security issues i think that we can take advantage of uh, uh, of this type of energy source which is all and my words are not simply subjective i would say they are more or less um, repeated through a decision that was, that was taken like uh, six months ago about the taxonomies. Well, you know that uh, a nuclear project became part of the taxonomy, which maybe for people doesn't mean shit. But anyways, it means that, uh, that uh, this is a, uh, let's say, green and sustainable investment. So private money could be distributed to that kind of project. So it will facilitate building new uh, nuclear uh, power plants. So I think that this was, I would say, kind of success here. One of the, not very many, but then we managed, and this crisis managed to shift the position of a lot of people. And now we believe that, uh, yeah, that the nuclear is green energy. So let's now switch a bit to uh, transport policy. That's your other main committee. You are a coordinator, so you are coordinating the work of the socialists in, the, in this committee. So... Uh, for, for for people, usually transport policy is not exactly the most sexy uh, topic, and it's they don't exactly see what uh, what are the stakes. So, can you briefly tell us like what do you do in the transport? Uh, what is what important things are you doing in the transport committee? Well, uh, you know that transport sector is responsible for uh, uh, almost thirty percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. And unfortunately, we are not make we are not able to reduce these figures. Uh, and when it comes to pollution, transport is a key factor. So, what we try to do is also to try to change to reshape the European transport 
so that it will pollute less how we want to make it through different policies in different sectors. For instance, uh, I know that it, it might sound sexy or not, I don't know, but uh, yeah, we don't want to replace the old diesel uh, vehicles with the electrics, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, you know, the, the bottom idea behind the, the shift be, behind the transport transformation is using the public transport and stepping out of the cars. For that, we need green, we need more sustainable, we need more comfortable, we need more effective public transport. Uh, of course, we also try to, to maybe not to force, but to foster using the, the railway transport because this is the cleanest transport. In order to do so, we do several things when it comes to rail. Uh, standardization, because now at the border, you don't you don't use uh, cross-border trains because you have to stay at the border and it's not comfortable staying 10 hours to change the locomotive or to change the driver. Uh, standardization, improving infrastructure, uh, creating big, uh, more dense network, uh, also making the intermodality, uh, but also making this uh, railway transport more uh, more comfortable. Also uh, introducing night trains, but also uh, better access for people with disabilities, uh, rooms for storing bicycles in the wagons. So a lot of possibilities for improving that type of transport so that it will replace short haul flights, for instance. When it comes to air transport, the idea is to slightly to reduce the number of flights if we create additional uh, alternative, like I said, through railway, for instance, but also in time to change the fuel of the of the aircrafts it will be very difficult to electrify the aircrafts of course but you can use e-fuels synthetic fuels biofuels instead of the regular fuels yes they are more expensive now but but also this is very important to keep also the competitiveness of the european carriers because it, it is also a challenge when it comes to maritime, we have a similar situation. You cannot electrify the maritime, but you can use, for instance, electricity, onshore electricity. You will force the, uh, the, the vessels to, to use this electricity, not uh, to turn on their engines so that they will pollute less when ashore. Also, to use uh, different types of fuels, gradually increasing the proportion and the number of that synthetic fuels. And when it comes to the road transport, which is responsible for 70% of the pollution, then when we speak about light, uh, the regular vehicles or uh, light duty vehicles, yes, the, the road, the, the way forward is electrifying. We have to switch internal combustion engine with uh, with electric vehicles, and we have certain um, laws and certain legislative files for that. And when it comes to heavy duty vehicles, hydrogen or um, even um, electricity, but there are different options, even LNG. Uh, but we have options. So this is how we are going to tackle the, uh, the the shift in the mind when it comes to when it comes to transport. Of course, I can 
I can speak more in details. I don't know. Then, so may, maybe to, to stay uh, another question about transport, something that was a bit controversial, uh, but mostly uh, during, during the last mandate related to transport and also social policy was about tr the, the truck drivers, so the so-called posted workers uh, in, in truck driving. So to summarize, it was the practice that uh, you would have Western countries that would hire, let's say, Bulgarian truck drivers at Bulgarian wages and then have them do... Uh, Tra truck driving within uh, within the Western co Western countries. So the Western countries were tr Western truckers were upset because they considered it uh, to be unfair competition, etc., etc. So there was a, an attempt of the EU to solve to solve that, but that was uh, very controversial. Uh, are you uh, as a Bulgarian? So the, 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 the let's say Eastern European country were very invested in this country. Uh, are you satisfied with the solutions that have been found uh, on the on on the truck drivers' right and all that? No, for some reasons, of course, to some extent, yes, like posting is something very important and yes, it could distort the market, the free market. And I know that, and we still, despite of the fact that we made some changes, now we have a lot of issues. I met ETF two days ago, or last week, uh, the European uh, Transport Federation. And they mentioned that the, the problem with the post, especially workers from third country, still exists. And it's very complicated in an open market to, to identify, for instance, people from, uh, you, or from Ukraine or from, from another third country based in, for instance, Lithuania, but never worked in Lithuania. There's some Lithuania license go and drive in Germany, still this problem exists. But of course, posting is important. Uh, and from that perspective and for improving the conditions of the drivers, I'm satisfied with uh, the mobility package um, incentives. But when it comes to returning empty trucks every eight weeks, this is nonsense, complete bullshit. And let's be honest, if we try to to make the green deal it's simply irrational to to carry empty trucks all around europe you are not helping for the green transition in transport so from that perspective i cannot be satisfied but it was done mainly to reduce the competitiveness of the eastern european uh holding companies this was basically the idea anyways now nothing happened nothing happened now the problem is that we still miss truck drivers we miss 500,000 truck drivers in the european union this is a huge problem and we have to solve that problem because you spoke about the truck drivers how can we so solve it we have to rebuild the image of the truck driver we have to first to improve the conditions the working conditions we need parking spaces there is not, not enough. We need toilets there uh, because some people don't see their family for a month. They need at least to, uh, I don't want to be vulgar, but uh, at least to go to a toilet normally. Then uh, we need better access because in some countries, in order to receive a license for a professional driver, it costs 13,000 euro. And imagine. There are not very many 20 years old who has who have 20,000 euro, uh, 13,000 euro to pay to to get a license. So maybe we should think of a mechanism who will support those youngsters who would like to become professional dri uh, dri uh, drivers because it's stupid. And also, I think that we should reduce the lower age of the truck driver. In many countries, uh, the age is 21, but in some 18 years old, I think that it should be 18, 18 years old because it makes no sense to be able to fly with an uh, air carrier, to, to fly with 200 passengers when you are 18, to become a pilot when you are 18 in pretty much everywhere in the European Union, but you are not allowed to drive a heavy duty vehicle it makes no sense mm -hmm. so if you want to fill that gap of 500,000 you have to improve the conditions of course improving the the salaries uh, 
it's completely but it's let's say market-based principle but you have to improve the access uh you have to improve the working conditions basically to improve the image and also to give some benefits to those who uh, perform that uh, profession either early re retirement or uh, some um, rabats in the health insurance a lot of things should be done because if we don't do this then we will have no uh, food in the supermarkets mm -hmm. Let's switch a bit to, 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 to all the various topics. Uh, some of them we already mentioned it before, before the interview. So today the parliament adopted a resolution that uh, supported uh, Romania and Bulgaria to enter the Schengen area, which you are not, you're, you're not part of for the, for the time being. Uh, so first question, are you happy with this result? And then what are the next steps? Uh, yes, of course I'm happy, but let me tell you, I don't know whether people know what Schengen is. <laughs> But I can tell you what Schengen for Bulgarian is. Uh, now, 26 million European citizens cannot benefit from the free movement. Because, yes, we are part of the European Union, but we don't move like the normal Europeans do. Uh, so being outside of Schengen means that, for instance, in Bulgaria, if you want to go for a vacation in Greece, especially during the season, you have to wait 24 hours at the Bulgarian Greek border. If you want to move some goods from Bulgaria to Romania, you have to wait 24 hours at the border, which is close to one of to the fifth uh, biggest Bulgarian city. So the trucks are almost downtown this city when you have uh, additional pollution, when you have... Uh, preconditions for uh, car accidents when you uh, when you have um, problems for the economy because uh, waiting there uh, goods are waiting there for 24 hours and it's problematic it, because it, it it means that you spend money uh, so it makes this transport more expensive so basically this is what we see from Schengen and if you for my like myself if i go and because i fly i have at least four flights a week and they treat me as if i'm a third national uh, as i'm a person from third uh, from third from a third country so if i fly from sofia to to vienna i got checked myself again so it and it's not fair because in the european union what is important is to when you fulfill certain criteria you can become part of the club. And Bulgaria and Romania, according to the European Commission, according to the European Par Parliament, according to every responsible authority, fulfilled all the criteria 11 years ago. But now we are, and that's why we believe that this decision for letting Bulgaria and, uh, and uh, Romania in Schengen is crucial. And I'm not here because it is discriminatory and in this situation when we have in europe when we definitely need different level of integration higher level of integration when you need coherence between the different countries keeping some two countries outside of the of the club brings not only material damages but i would say more more importantly um, reputational damage because it creates additional anti-European moods in these countries, additional lack of trust in the European institutions and in which in this situation of war that we are having some several hundred kilometers away from the Bulgarian border is, I would say, huge problem. So yes, wrapping up, uh, this was important signal from the European Parliament that Bulgaria and Romania should be uh, considered part of Schengen area and this should be done by by the end of the year. This is the first uh, the first uh, resolution uh, that has binding time. Uh, so this is this was important and this uh, this was by the way also a good result for our efforts. Hopefully they can be also seen.
And, and so now the, the ball is in the court of, of member states. They, they have to decide by December whether to accept uh, Bulgaria and Romania in, in, uh, in Schengen. And you, you said it, uh, Bulgaria on paper is fulfilling all the criteria to join Schengen for, for 11 years. It's, uh, for, in your view, it's uh, discriminatory that, uh, that Bulgaria is not there. So if uh, the member state refuse again to let Bulgaria enter Schengen in December, Uh, should Bulgaria sue the uh, the uh, the EU at the Court of Justice? So what what should be the next step? Uh, I wouldn't say only on paper, because you said fulfilled criteria on paper. But there were many evaluations and many assessments done by the competitive uh, by the competent authorities uh, made some several years ago. Uh, and also we have this initiative by the Bulgarian and Romanian government. Uh, we created a so-called fact-finding mission when the experts from different countries from the European Union could come and see to the Bulgarian borders and to see whether we fulfill the criteria in terms of using the Schengen um, information system, uh, visa information system, or uh, police cooperation, or keeping the air, land, and um, sea borders. The, evalu the evaluation has been done. So this is important for us. I don't know what the, what the procedure could be. Suing or appealing, I'm not really aware. I know that what we had to do here as, member, as a representatives of my country in the European Parliament, we did it. So we initiated, we were part of this initiative. We initiated this resolution, which sent a really strong signal to, to the other institutions. In the chat, I have, I have a few questions. I'm just going to pick, uh, pick one uh, yeah. that, that I think is, uh, is interesting. It's uh, about the, the, uh, the potential level of abuses in uh, Euro, the use of Euro, European funds in Bulgaria. And so the, uh, the, the person says, oh, yeah, there, there is a lot of abuses in, uh, in, uh, in the use of EU money in, uh, in, in Bulgaria. Should there be like uh, an intervention from the, uh, prosec the European prosecutor's, uh, prosecutor's office or to let's say, fight back against, uh, against these kind of, uh, of practices. Uh, do you agree that there is a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, misuse of EU money in Bulgaria? And should uh, the, the, the European authorities go investigate? Yes, I do agree that there is a lot of misuse uh, and abuse of uh, European money. And I'm absolutely frank. Yes, we have problems with this. But it has nothing to do with Schengen. Yeah, no, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, because no, because the argument of one of the countries was the corruption but corruption is a, it's a pandemic uh, which should be tackled and yes we had issues with that hopefully with uh, the um, uh, establishment of the prosecutor's office here in brussels in luxembourg i think we are going to add up additional instrument for tackling that corruption that we face not only in Bulgaria and Romania, but also in the, in the other member states. Because this corruption cannot be tolerated, uh, no, matter where, uh, no matter where it occurs. And, and a final question about Bulgaria itself. So uh, you know that a number of countries want to join the EU, notably in the Balkan, and one of them is North Macedonia. And uh, as it happened, the... the, the The process for North Macedonia to, to join the EU, to negotiate a decision to the EU, has become a bit complicated because Bulgaria had a feud with North Macedonia for linguistic and historic reasons. So can you explain a bit why is Bulgaria, was Bulgaria uh, uh, being, let's say, difficult with North Macedonia? And uh, has there been like solutions found on that? I would say that this is a very complicated Honestly, I try, we have been communicating this forever. And it is very difficult, especially for people from Balkans will understand me, honestly, because we have similar issues there. But the problem is not neither linguistic nor historical. Neither linguistic nor historical. Of course, we uh, give the, the North Macedonia the opportunity to choose and to use their language and uh, of course uh, this is a separate people uh, with separate i would say history recent history but the problem the problem is uh, that uh, 
there are, this is really interesting, there are two political parties who, which have the same name, both called VMRL, from both sides of the border. And I would say that from both sides, they are fueling the conflict. Uh, once it used to be one party, single party. Anyways, uh, the, the problem is that uh, we have certain issues concerning the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the hate speech, which is a serious problem for me. But I think that in the end, we will be able to find a solution. I think that uh, the council came, came up with a good conclusion just several months ago. Uh, I think the North Macedonia should do a small adjustment in their constitution in order to start uh, the real negotiation, the real negotiations and negotiating process. And I think that we should not fuel that conflict, especially in a, in a situation when we have a lot of additional tense uh, and geopolitical fightings. So hopefully, uh, we will have a positive conclusion on this one. But this is very, I, would, I wouldn't say, in, I would say it's not interesting for the, for the people for Western Europe. They would never understand it. Yeah, I, so I'm French, so I have to say that uh, when, I, when I saw that happening, I was like, I was a bit confused, but why are they, are, are they suddenly fighting each other? I mean, I knew about Greece and Macedonia, about the, about the name of the country, and then there was Bulgaria. I was a bit confused as to uh, what, what was happening there, so also why I wanted to, to, to ask the question. To Look, understand. The real integration, we used to be one, one state, one people. We used to be. Uh, but anyways... We, I really don't don't want to look back in back in the past, but if we want to have real integration, then this comes with the opening the borders, facilitating the business, facilitating the transport corridors. This should be done in order to stop all these all these tensions. This is the only solution. This is the recipe. Well, you don't. Let's not talk about the this past. Is the then description. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Let, let, let's not talk about the past, then let's talk about the future, the future of Europe. So there, there is a lot of debate these days about how should we reform the uh, European Union, sh what should be, uh, should be changed, etc., etc. So in your opinion, what, what should be changed in priority in, uh, in European Union to make it more democratic, make it function better, etc.? Uh, to me, honestly, in order to be uh, the European Union, to be a geopolitical player. It needs to improve several things. First is security. You cannot rely on somebody else's security. Otherwise, you will never be considered as a geopolitical player if you don't have the ability to act yourself. So in terms of security and defense, I think that we need uh, additional deepening the cooperation also maybe we need more flexibility when it comes to taking the decisions uh, because the problem of the european union is that it's kind of slow because of the mechanism of taking decisions sometimes you know the different countries gather then they discuss then they go back to their uh states communicating there then go back return and if we're speaking about the crisis, obviously we are not reacting uh, fast enough. So I think that this we should maybe consider a mechanism for faster uh, decision-making process. Uh, but look, it is very difficult for the European Union to be, I would say, more coherent because different countries they have different specifications and different national interests, sometimes confronting with the uh, other countries' national interests. So it's it's kind of complicated too. I think we are far away from federalizing the European Union. I don't know whether this is the idea of the federal uh, of the European Union, but uh, there certainly have a lot of things that should be improved in order. Uh, to function, I would say, more efficiently. 
and you since you mentioned efficiently and efficiency the fact that we need to make uh, decision making a, a bit faster uh, one of the big debate is whether uh, vetoes uh, the veto power of of member states should be kept uh, so do you think that member states should lose their veto right should they keep it in certain policies i can only express personal opinion here of course uh, to me uh coming from a country which is not relatively big i would say middle country but the the right of veto is one of the very few instruments that especially small countries have in the decision making process so from from that perspective i don't see i don't consider reasonable the opportunity to lose that instrument so i'm not really in favor of that and the, the, still, still on that on of that subject this should not be used as blackmail that was my next question because then when you look at uh, at orban for but for instance have, uh... yeah but then look we could have uh, we could develop a better mechanism because there are some options in the middle for instance at least two countries to or at least overcoming the veto in an, in a certain way could also be an option but yes i know that this is used by or abuse this instrument is used by some country for blackmailing yes it it could be i don't know this problem could be overcome but on the other hand really uh, coming from a country with i would say i wouldn't i shouldn't say so but with let's say uh the low value it's very difficult to to influence mm -hmm. so this is uh, an opportunity uh, for additional influence uh, the right of veto and and you also mentioned the the, the uh, more defense uh, more uh, more european uh, european security uh, system so Ultimately, what are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, uh, the so-called European Army? Are we talking about in the end just mere cooperation? Uh, where where should we go? Well, I think we are far away from the European Army. <laughs> we all know it. But uh, there were, I think, three scenarios during presented by the former president of the Commission. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the European ar Army sounds very far away but deepening the co uh, cooperation um, which means we have a uh, pesco so-called pesco i don't know what it's called pesco in bulgaria i think it's still pesco i don't remember uh which is um, mm -hmm. improvement of the cooperation in the field of security and defense for instance common projects common transborder projects uh common uh, procurement which will help uh, i would say to reduce the cost of the certain defensive products so we have options there but to me definitely the european union should have its own force uh, the number the command is something that maybe should be discussed but in the end if you want to be a real ge geopolitical player you cannot rely on somebody else's security uh, you mentioned yeah. as well that uh, bulgaria is a small country so that's why you were uh, you, you would i would consider a small but yeah it's not Big. You're not the biggest. You're not the biggest. <laughs> Let's say it like that, like this. Uh, so uh, that's one of the reasons why you think the veto sh sh should be kept. But to 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 come back to the the the, the fact that you uh, on Schengen, you think that the other countries are are discriminatory towards uh, towards your country, towards Romania, etc. How do you think uh, the 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 what could be done to make other countries evolve in their views? In the view of Bulgaria, or smaller countries to over, like let's say uh, France and Germany, say, "Oh, they're just small country; they should do what we uh, what we want." And uh, uh, they're from Eastern Europe, blah blah blah. So, uh, how to improve, let's say, the relationship, the, the consideration to 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 to, to notably Eastern country and smaller countries? Uh, it's kind of a complicated question because honestly, we see differences here, and I very often i speak about it when i came here and i came to this political family and to me socialism means one thing for the dutch socialist socialism means completely different thing for the french socialist so socialism mean, 
13. So we have differences, but that is absolutely normal. Uh, and yes, we see a lot of differences between the countries from the north compared to those in the south, countries from the west, those in the east. But how we manage to overcome those differences, the first thing and the first and most important thing is the dialogue through dialogue. If you are active enough here, then you got respect and you are respected. Uh, so if you really are able to, uh, to defend with arguments your national position, it might differ from somebody else's position, but it, you will be respected. Because the, uh, my, uh, I would say, concern and my reserves to some of the Bulgarian governments uh, is that very often we do not defend our national interest, and especially in the case of Macedonia. That's why you are perplexed and you are kind of confused, because for three years we didn't say anything. We didn't say that we had a problem. Yes, we all know that we had a problem, but never mentioned, never mentioning among the different formats, among the different, uh, within the different institutions. So maybe if you are vocal enough and able enough to express your national position, then it will be easier for the rest to, to understand you. Or at least that's what we are trying to do here. Um, final question, because I see the time going. I don't want to, to, to keep you uh, too, too late in the office. Uh, final question from the chat. Do you think that we'll ever, you, we will ever see a, commi a European Commission directly elected by citizens? No. No, I don't. No, even, I even in the future, no, you... I don't know how. I don't, I don't know how. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Um, It's kind of complicated, but uh, maybe the Spitzenkandidat, remember, maybe this is a good mechanism, but it was jeopardized, unfortunately. Uh, so, but then, yeah, this question is reasonable because it refers to the lack of leadership. Because now we are facing some kind of administrative leadership here, and you lack the real leadership. And... Let's be honest, not very many people know who Ursula von der Leyen is. Not very many, especially in my country, or uh, Mr. Shevchuk is, or uh, Ilva Johans, or whoever commissioner you need to. Uh, but um, I really don't think that we will be able to elect uh, our commissioners. But definitely, yes, we need more leadership. Uh, we should uh, try to cut that administrative leadership. Uh, because even those who know those people that I mentioned, they don't consider them as leaders. Hmm. And then, like, uh, how would you say, what could be done to improve then the leadership? Realistically speaking. First, maybe we should improve the image of the European Union among the, among the, the European citizens. Because... Uh, If we show double standard, it will be very difficult. Then, of course, uh, we also have to work in that direction. Those who are part of the European institutions. And I know that sometimes it's easier to blame the European Union for what you didn't manage to do yourself. And it's tempting. But uh, So I feel that part of the, uh, how to say it, Uh, the problem is in ourselves, but in us as member of the European Parliament, because it's ridiculous to be member of the European Parliament and to be Eurosceptic. So to me, it's kind of, you know, it's like a schizophrenia. On the other hand, very often the government say, oh, it's European Union's fault that we didn't do this or that. When it's sim simply the problem is somewhere else. So we have to improve the image of the European Union, but also European Union should come close to the European citizens. Because now it seems that this is something far away from the everyday life, which is unfortunately it's not true. Mm. Well, uh, Peter Vitanov. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Peter Vitanov, for, for taking your time to thank answer you. our questions uh, tonight. Before you go, if people have to remember one thing from tonight, what is your message to them? I really don't know. Honestly, <laughs> don't remember anything. I, I didn't say anything smart. But honestly, uh, one thing is that I'm, I really 
I don't know, I put all my heart in that because I believe that this change, the, this change that we all foresee and we all work for depends on each and every one of us. So if you work with heart and if you believe in what you do, then uh, eventually it will happen. So, yeah. That's very clear. Thank you very much, Peter Vitanov. Uh, Chat, make sure to, to thank him for his time. You can follow me on Twitter. You see the, the Twitter at just below his video feed. Uh, Mr. Vitanov, I wish you a good evening. Uh, you. And well, I hope you enjoyed the interview and uh, that we uh, will have the occasion to see you in the future again. Thanks. It's, it was a pleasure, honestly. Perfect. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Chat, uh, let's start the debrief. Let me just up switch on my camera so that we can... Oh, first, I need to... Turn off Zoom. Now, my camera, in the meantime, tell me what you thought about the interview. Up. This. That. Up. Am I back? Yay! Hi, chat. So, all right. Uh, tell me what you thought about uh, the interview. In the meantime, I have my notes so we can look at this and comment. I'm not, I'm not going to stay too long uh, tonight because I have to, to pack my bags. I'm, I'm leaving Brussels. Well, I'm leaving Brussels. I'm going on a work trip tomorrow, so I have to pack my stuff. So I, I'm not staying too, too, too long tonight, uh, unfortunately. Um, you found his answer quite confusing. Uh, I mean, to be fair, on some, on some things, it was complicated topics. And also, it's late. I mean, I, I, I can get that uh, that for him. Also, it, it can be complicated to 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 be uh, to be clear when it's uh, nine in the evening uh, and he had a long long day uh, before him. But uh, hopefully, I mean, if you thought some things were confusing, tell me, and I'll try to decipher things and make them a bit clearer. Uh, but let's start by the beginning. Why didn't I ask your questions? I mean, to be fair, uh, part of your questions were out of scope. Like the last one was. On national politics and I don't cover national politics uh, and the other ones that were like either too many either because like unfortunately I uh, I only have one hour to do to do this so uh, when MPs talk for half an hour like I have to make choices like I didn't have time to ask all my questions that I prepare for myself so I have to to, to make choices so I, I took a couple of yours I but I couldn't take uh, everything unfortunately so I have to to make uh, executive decisions uh, Unfortunately, uh, you like that he commented on the Schengen situation, but I think that on the topic, the topic North Macedonia should have been discussed more. I mean, North Macedonia, you could discuss it for a very long time. I mean, all these topics, you could spend an hour just talking about them. I mean, let's be, let's be honest, you could spend an hour on, on, on Schengen, you could spend an hour on North Macedonia and uh, uh, generally speaking, integration uh, and all this, but I mean, here it's to give us a snapshot of, of what they think. Uh, of course, that, that would be always worse to, to, to dig a bit deeper into things and, uh, and all that. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have the occasion with other MEPs to, to, to dig into it uh, further. Um, okay, so on my notes, what do I have? Uh, very quickly, uh, we talked a lot about the Green Deal and the, uh, and the economic impact of, the, of climate change because he said at some point, yeah, if you listen to the right, uh, so the PPs, uh, they will say, oh yeah, but climate change, uh, well, it's, it's bad, but uh, we have to protect businesses, so we have to make sure that the economic impact is, is managed, so we can't be too ambitious, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and he said, yeah, no, actually, uh, climate change does have very clear economic uh, consequences on everyone. So he mentioned, yes, in, uh, in Bulgaria, the, the Danube, so the... the, 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 the uh, big uh, bad waterway that they go through uh, Bulgaria. He described it as as the vein of uh, of Bulgaria. Uh, when it's dry, well, boats can uh, cannot circulate or less boats can circulate, which uh, creates uh, economic problems for everyone. So, climate change creates economic problems for everyone, which is why we should uh, we, we should solve them. That's uh, that was a bit his uh, his, uh, his point. And then on the other end, said yeah, but uh, the Greens on the other on the other end are saying, for instance, oh yes, we should solve the climate change and pretty much sacrifice everything on uh, be ready to sacrifice everything uh, to 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 solve climate change, including by uh, making things uh, making things a bit unbearable for uh, the, the 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 poorer people. If I if I if I sum up, so he said, yeah, no, us as socialists, we try to find a more middle ground in the sense that yes, we want climate change, we want to change climate, change. we want to stop climate change, but at the same time, we want to protect the the, the, the poor people so that it's because it's still manageable for them and that uh, uh, it doesn't turn them against uh, 
uh, against their environmental policy because that's a real risk. Like I mentioned during the interview, at some point I made a reference to, to the yellow jacket. So for those, those of you who don't know what the yellow jackets are, it was a, a social movement, uh, protest, uh, protest uh, movement in France uh, back in 2018, 2017, 2018. Where basically, there, in France, there was an attempt to put a tax on fuel uh, that was supposed to help finance uh, green uh, policy. Uh, and so you were putting a tax on, on, on fuel. And so it, it, uh, it started a process called the Yellow Jackets, which were people who were protesting against this tax, saying, oh, why should we, us, uh, let's say, regular Joes, poor people, pay a tax uh, for environmental policy? We want, uh, we want cheap fuel, so we are not agree. So it started from then, then uh, from that. Then it, it, it went into these different topics, etc., etc. But it started as a protest movement against a policy that was initially made for to 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 uh, to fight climate change. So it uh, it's the first one of the first movements that uh, arose where you could see the social aspects of the of, of the the climate transition in the sense that yes, you have to change climate, you have to stop climate change, but you also have to make sure that it's uh, socially acceptable and that it doesn't like. Uh, uh, break the back of of poor people, and that's why you have a, a lot of concern since then in many member states uh, when they are talking about environmental policy in uh, in Brussels. They're saying, "Oh yes, but let's be careful because my people will be pissed off if we if we do this, if we make it uh, too too burdensome for them." So if, so we need to be uh, uh, we need to be careful with things. Uh, what else did we talk about? Uh, we briefly talked about lobbying. Uh, I didn't go too much into it, even if it was a question I received from uh, from, from from someone. But he said, "Oh yeah, lobbying is uh, is pretty normal in uh, in Brussels." As a uh, uh, he, he said himself, "Oh yeah, I receive uh, people from uh, all sides, whether for, uh, for I don't want to say people against uh, for environmental policy, but who are less ambitious, let's say, uh, than, than others." And he said, "Yeah, it's a." Uh, it's part of the process, it's normal, but then it's a, a political matter and technical matter. You take the decisions and on how far you're willing to go on the policy, but it's, uh, it's not uh, it's not anorm abnormal that you have people who want, le uh, who want less ambition from uh, from environmental policy, that they are they, 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 they can say they are their piece uh, in uh, to the commission, to member of the parliament, etc., etc. Um, we talked about nuclear. It, it was very clear, very clear that uh, uh, socialist Bulgarians are very much in favor of uh, the nuclear energy, uh, saying that for him it's a, it's a big part. It will be part of the, the green transition because it's a, uh, it doesn't emit uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide. Uh, so he's very much in favor of it. He, was, he also mentioned something called the, the EU taxonomy. So what is that? Uh, the green taxonomy, to, like, like we call it. It's basically a label. It's the it's a way, it's basically a list in which you label things to tell investors, private sector, say, okay, you, if you invest in these things, in these kind of energies, so green energies or energies that are meant for the green transition, then it receives, let's say, a, a green label. So that's the EU taxonomy. It's a way to, uh, to direct investment towards, let's say, greener investments in, in the field of energy. And so you have, of course, renewable energy in this, and you also have, at least the commission uh, included it uh, in there, you also have nuclear energy and uh, gas in, the, in there, which sparked a lot of debates, uh, notably on the, on, the, on the left side, uh, or left side, uh, left politics, because they were saying oh, it's completely absurd that we're supposed to do, it's supposed to be a green instrument, and we add non-green uh, energies in there, such as nuclear, such as uh, natural gas, and it's Something that uh, uh, has been dividing countries and, and political groups ever since. Like you, like you, like I mentioned on the left, uh, within the socialists, you have people who are completely against uh, the taxonomy to include nuclear and, and glass and other, like uh, Mr. Vidanov, who think that on the contrary, it's a good thing that nuclear, for instance, is in the green taxonomy. And so uh, it's a very divisive uh, topic between countries as well, because it depends on the energy mix, like France, for instance, wanted the nuclear in the in the list because 70% of the electricity in France is produced uh, with uh, with nuclear energy the germans uh, rely a lot on gas so they wanted the gas in there etc etc but it's a, it's a pending decision because you had luxembourg and another country i think austria who actually sued the commission so they are attacking uh, the, the european commission injustice at the court of justice of the european union 
to try to uh, stop this green taxonomy because they consider that the, co the commission went too far. It didn't respect its mandate. There should have been a law. Uh, they, they should have been uh, the, the, the European Parliament and the, co and the Council, so member states should have been asked if they wanted the nuclear and the, the, the gas to go into the green taxonomy. And so they are suing the commission to try to have the, the, the court cancel the, the, the green taxonomy. So it is the very beginning. We'll see in, the, uh, in six months or, or, or more uh, what the court decides. Uh, but that will make for, for interesting uh, and absolutely, uh, uh, how can I say it, peaceful discussions, I, I am certain. Uh, I'm going to skip on transport policy. Uh, Schengen. Uh, so Schengen was interesting because you could see and uh, different in the chat was pretty eager to, uh, to, to talk about it. Uh, because for 11 years, uh, Bulgaria and Romania fulfilled the criteria to join Schengen. So Schengen is this uh, area of members of European, uh, the European Union where you can move freely. There is no border between them. So between France and, uh, and Germany, France and, uh, and Italy, etc. There is no border, but they are part of the Schengen area. So you can freely cross the border. Uh, and it's not only people, it's also uh, goods. But uh, you have to, to enter the Schengen area. You have to fulfill a number of criteria. And for the past 11 years, Romania and, Mas and uh, Macedonia and Bulgaria uh, should have been able to enter uh, the Schengen area because they were fulfilling the criteria. But they, it, it has not been so because the other countries, uh, let's, uh, let's be honest, a lot of Western countries, uh, refused uh, to, to, to grant that officially because they considered that there is... Uh, there are problems of of, of corruption in in the, in Romania in Bulgaria, uh, also for political reasons because uh, uh, they they, uh, they it would not be popular with their with their own population to uh, let's say have uh, uh, the, the 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 news say oh yeah from now on Romanian people and Bulgarian people can move uh, can move freely and and go in France and go in Germany etc etc for 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 some reason it's true that. Uh, uh, for the Western countries, they see Bulgaria and Romania as uh, poor countries. So there is a bit this concern from, from regular people say, oh, they will come to my country and take my jobs and, uh, and all that. So there, there is a bit indeed of, uh, of stereotypes and all that that, uh, that participated in the fact that, this, that Romania and Bulgaria have been prevented from entering uh, Schengen for 11 years. Uh, now, the, today, the, 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 the Parliament took, uh, adopted a resolution, so a political text. It's not, a, it's not a law. It's, a, it's a, the Parliament uh, saying, okay, on the topic of Schengen, we think that uh, Romania and Bulgaria should enter. It's not mandatory, but they're saying they're basically they're, they're telling to the to the council, so to member states, we want you to accept Bulgaria and Romania, and so they gave them until uh, December to do so. So in December there will be a a meeting of the of the of the member state and they will have to decide and take a stand on whether or not they want to let Romania or not uh, join the EU. But on this, we will we will see how uh, what happens. But even if may, like he mentioned, there are very concrete uh, consequences on, on whether or not to be uh, in uh, in uh, in the Schengen area. Like uh, he mentioned, the fact that uh, uh, you have. Uh, uh, lines and lines of trucks at the border that you have to wait 24 hours if you want to leave the country, etc., etc. There is the uh, underlying discrimination between Bulgaria and Romania and the rest of the EU, so it's not exactly sending a strong sense of solidarity and uh, and unity and tolerance within within European Union. Um, we talked about North Macedonia, uh, so here I was a bit surprised because, uh, like again, for, I'm French. For me, the topic of North Macedonia and Bulgaria. I was a bit, I'm a, I'm a bit perplexed by, by the thing. He said, "Oh yeah, that's also normal because for years we didn't talk about it, and suddenly we we put a veto on things, and uh, the other were like, what the fuck? Why, why, why are they suddenly uh, saying no to to North Macedonia?'" Uh, he said that it's not for for historical reasons. Uh, I don't know if there are Bulgarians in the chat to explain a bit the, uh, uh, the the context, but I was reading an article like before the before the stream about that. And like right now, there is like a uh, there, there is an agreement that was signed between uh, North Macedonia and Bulgaria, specifically on history, because in the past uh, there used to be a kingdom that was across what is today North Macedonia and uh, uh, and, and Bulgaria, and 
there is a tussle about whether the, the king back then should be considered Bulgarian or Macedonian. So there is a bit of historic heritage on who uh, who can cla lay claim on uh, uh, where was the big king back then uh, from, whether it was Bulgarian or Macedonian. And so they're, they're, uh, they're discussing about how they should interpret hist their common history, how things should be in, uh, in, into, uh, uh, say, uh, school books. How, uh, what do you teach to kids uh, in Macedonia uh, about this period? This sort of thing. So it's a bit perplexed because it really came at the last moment. Uh, well, not at the last moment, but uh, uh, we knew very well that there were problems between Greece and North Macedonia because for before it was, the country was called North Macedonia, it was called Macedonia. And it pissed off Greece because Greece has a region called Macedonia. So you say, oh, yeah, but uh, it will create confusion. It will feed uh, separatism from uh, uh, from our region of Macedonia. Uh, it's uh, uh, the country is stealing away a part of our history because Macedonia is Greece, blah, 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 blah. So for years and years, Greece and uh, was basically preventing any negotiation uh, for North Macedonia to join the EU until they found a deal. That was politically costly for, for both sides and because it was a very sensitive to topic where no, uh, well, Macedonia agreed to change its name officially. And so it became North Macedonia to create the distinction between like the, the Greece, the Greek Macedonia and what is now North Macedonia. And so that solved a bit the issues between, between Greece and, Mace and North Macedonia. And so Everyone's like, oh, yeah, great. Uh, finally, the issue's in solve. And then suddenly, Bulgarian arrives and yeah, no, we're not solved. We have problems because of history, etc., etc. And so it was, uh, we were uh, up for another round on the on the, on the problems with, uh, with North Macedonia. But let's see if things improve. Um, and final thing, now two things I want to finish with. Um, something he said when we talked about the veto, the veto right, so uh, in EU decision in certain uh, areas. You need to take decisions at unanimity, meaning that all countries of the EU need to agree on the decision for the decision to be adopted. So that means that each country has a veto. He can block the decision if he wants. And there is a big debate on whether this veto should be kept, at least in some area, for instance, in the, in the field of taxation, in the field of foreign affairs, etc., etc. And so when I asked him, oh, should we get rid of the, of the, of the vetoes, like, uh, a lot of people are asking. He said no, because uh, the veto is uh, the only way for smaller countries to uh, to make sure that their interests are taken into account. Because he said, yeah, uh, we are Bulgaria, we're not a big country. Uh, if I don't have the veto, then the French, the Germans, the big countries will just ignore us and roll over us and we will... We will our interests will not be defended with, without this, and that's a, especially that's true in the in the field of uh, uh, of uh, foreign affairs, but not only, uh, where you have, for instance, uh, Cyprus, Greece, that have very specific foreign affairs issues, and they are afraid that if they were to lose the veto, well, the EU would no longer uh, pay attention to what the Greek and the uh, and Cyprus is thinking about uh, Turkey, for instance, for instance. Uh, Netherlands, Ireland, Luxembourg, they would, they would die before giving up their veto on uh, um, on taxation because, of course, they are very they are very advantageous tax systems, uh, and they would lose their this uh, this uh, the tax action systems if they were to lose the veto. So uh, it's uh, it's something that you hear often from small countries is the idea that the veto is the the way for them to ensure that the big ones do not. Uh, enforce their will is that it's not just France, Germany that uh, that do what they want and the small countries do not have a say in, in the matter. Uh, okay, so for, uh, by the way, thanks for the follow. I, I forgot to mention it. Uh, uh, so for me, it's in a historical problem. We were one and now we're separate. We're still the same people, but in two separate countries. But many Macedonians refuse to accept that we have almost basically the same story. That's my view. That's your view. Please don't console you. I, I'm not here to console you. I mean, again, I don't know the the, 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 the topic enough, so that's why I asked for uh, uh, for for the the, the view of uh, of uh, of Bulgarian people. So, but okay, uh, that that I, I got indeed the idea that the country it used to be now it's two countries it used to be one, and so there is a, a fight about the 
historic her her heritage, but uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ban you. Um, and final topic I wanted to discuss when we talked about uh, uh, the uh, future of Europe, how uh, should there be like a, uh, a commission directly elected by citizens? It was very clear, he said, no, there won't be a commission elected by citizens. And he said uh, instead, oh, well, maybe the, uh, the, the way to... to, to to go forward is uh, something that is called the Spitzen Candidat. Uh, no, I don't want to buy followers. Screw you. How do I ban you? See? Him? I will... Uh, I I'm going to cancel him. See? That's it. As long as you, as long as you don't, do, don't do that, that, that's fine by me. But otherwise, uh, screw you. Up. Bye. Uh, where was I? Spitzen Candidat. Yes. Uh, so Spitzen Kandidat, what is this horrible name? Spitzen Kandidat is the name of the uh, of a system in which uh, at the European elections uh, you have why why the message doesn't go away? Uh, it's annoying. Ah, okay, I missed the thing. Uh, bannir temporairement, bannir. Up, aha, screw you, uh, screw you, bot. Like uh, what was I saying? Spitzen Kandidat, what is it? Take the European elections. Spitzen Kandidat is, you have each party, the DPP, so the, the right, the SND, the Socialist, the Greens, the Left, so every single European party that will say, I will designate one person, one candidate, and if I win the election, this person will become the next president of the commission. And so they go to the election and tell people, if you vote socialist, at the end is going to be this person who will be the, guy, who will be the president of the commission. If you go vote for EPP, it will be this person who will be president of the, of the commission. And so it's a way, A, to tell people, to allow people to indirectly vote for who would be the president of the, of the commission. And so give democratic legitimacy to, to that person. Uh, and be a, a way to increase the stake and give visibility and, uh, and, and power to the, to the job. And also to anchor the commission to the parliament. Because basically, since the, the, the head of the, of the commission would be designated because of the European election, because of the, the parliament, that means that the commission has to listen more closely to the parliament than, for instance, the council. That was a system that existed in 2014, so the, not the last election, the one before. Uh, you had this system uh, that was in place. And so that's how we got Jean-Claude Juncker uh, as president of the commission, because DPP, so the right, won the election. They were the ones who, who had the most seat. And so there was an agreement with all the, the other parties, pro-Union parties, to put him as president of the commission because he won the election. And so the council, the, the member states, Grumbled, they were not happy about that, but they put Juncker uh, nonetheless as, as president of the commission. Fast forward to 2019. Great, the parliament says, oh, okay, let's do again the Spitzen candidate. Uh, we will designate our candidate and this person will become president of the commission. Except that the, the council, so the member state, this time in 2019, they said, screw you, parliament, we're not going to do uh, that. We're going to nominate the person that we want. And it's not going to be who you decided because we are the member state, we are the one who decide, etc., etc. A neat way to think about the spin second is to think about as how every parliamentary system does it. Pretty much, yeah, you're right. Uh, pretty much, it's pretty much that. When the UK has an election, they don't vote for the peer. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a it's an indirect way to vote for who is the prime minister of Europe. You're right, LRD. That's one way to, to, to describe it. But let's go back to 2019. Council says, fuck you, Parliament. We're not going to do your spits and candidate thing. And instead, what they did, they selected someone who was from the party who won the election, because that's in the treaty. And the, the president of the commission has to be from the party who won the election. Well, has to take into account the result of the election. So de facto, it's uh, the, uh, the, 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 the head of the... Uh, the, the, the uh, he has to be from the party that won the election, so they put they, they, they propose Ursula von der Leyen, EPP, but who was not a candidate to become uh, to become MEP. Uh, she was not candidate to become president of the commission until late. It's really really the member state who came up and said, "Oh, Ursula, you're going to be candidate. You're president of the commission now." 
Uh, the fuck you was partly motivated by Manfred Weber being a uh, fucking his mechanic. yet. There is a bit of that. Uh, a bit of that, yes and no. Uh, so Manfred Weber, for those of you who don't know, he is the uh, president of the EPP, the party and the, 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 the political group in the, in, uh, in the parliament, and he was, the, in 2019, the Spitzen candidate, so the, the, the official candidate of the EPP to become head of the commission. Uh, except that uh, the council didn't like him for uh, different reasons. Uh, uh, the French, for instance, uh, it was just after Emmanuel Macron was elected as a, as a French president, and so he didn't want back then. He didn't want it to go into the traditional uh, party system, so he didn't want it to to elect someone that came from the the, the regular uh, political groups of of the parliament. And also, he didn't like the fact that Manfred Weber uh, didn't speak French because one of the informal condition to to be a candidate uh, in the uh, to become president of the of the commission is that you have to speak French. You have to speak, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the main language of the EU, and so often you have to speak French. And Manfred didn't speak French, so of course he was not considered as a viable candidate for, for, uh, by Macron. And then it was also a question of power. Manfred was a good excuse, let's say, for, for the council to refuse the Spitzer candidate. Because ultimately, like I mentioned, if you follow the Spitzer candidate system, it gives the power to the parliament, because it's the parliament that decides who becomes the next president of the commission and the and the council does not does not have a choice it has less choice in this and so it takes away its power and so after five years of Juncker who was more a bit let's say affiliated to the to the to the parliament and since he didn't owe anything to uh, to the council he was picking his mind and so from time to time he was also saying also saying screw you to the council which the council doesn't like and so the council said, well, screw you, Parliament. Uh, we're going to take back power. And so we're going to appoint someone that will be there because of us. And so she will owe us. And so that's how you, uh, you got Ursula van der Leyen from the EPP. It's true. But she was put there because of member states and notably because of Merkel and uh, Macron, meaning that she had a strong interest in listening to what France and uh, Germany are saying and the, and the member state in general. Especially now, if she wants to come back in after 2024 20, 20, uh, for a second mandate as the, as the uh, uh, president of the commission. So there is a, a very political uh, dimension to it because it's a, in the end behind the Spitzen candidates and who gets to decide who is the president of the, of the commission there is a question of balance of power between a political fight between the councils, the member state, and the European Parliament. Uh, and so, Parliament won in 2014, Council won in 2019. Uh, we will see what happens in 2024. Uh, I would be surprised if the Spitzen candidate comes back uh, because Council uh, has not changed its opinion uh, in the meantime, and uh, that you would need to have a a very strong personality uh, to uh, to be put as pizza candidate for four years of gen. But let's see. We'll, we'll see in 2024, but I'm not so hopeful about it. Uh, any questions you want me to cover? Uh, or I can start my conclusion. Uh, I give you a minute to tell me and I drink my water in the meantime. Otherwise, we'll conclude. All right, uh, I don't see anything in chat, so let me do my conclusion. So I hope that you enjoyed the interview. Um, when do we see each other next? We see each other on Sunday for my new uh, for Sunday format, which is called Eurobubble Therapy, where I invite two guests, uh, one cre usually creators or EU experts, to have a very chill discussion about EU news, uh, fun stuff that we saw about the EU uh, they, uh, we will discuss, they will, each guest will introduce us to a new topic, etc. So it's a pretty chill discussion. We will have that uh, next Sunday, uh, well, this Sunday at 7. Uh, so be there. Uh, the guest will be uh, Snore, who is uh, 
a person who is a person, someone who, an Irish person who is managing uh, a number of pro-European Reddit uh, board and also a bunch of pro-European Discord. And the second guest will be uh, Karim Alal, who is a Spanish YouTuber uh, who specializes on European politics. So we will discuss all that uh, together for a bit more than an hour on uh, Sunday and I hope you will be there uh, as usual if you like what you saw you can follow the channel that's always appreciated you can follow me on my other social media you have all the links now in chat uh, if you really enjoy what you saw you can uh, subscribe or toss a coin to your streamer via coffee uh, it's always very much appreciated and yeah on this note I wish you all a very good evening and I hope to see you uh, very soon bye guys